Williams in rainbow suspenders and goofy sunglasses was directed to sit down like an alien. He walked into the room and sat on a chair on his head. <laughs> Gary Marshall and the producers of uh, The Happy Days were blown away by Robin and they cast him. The raves for that single appearance on Happy Days spelled spin-off. When Marshall was approached by a young Michael Eisner at Paramount to fill a gap for the fall TV season, Mork and Mindy was born. The producers were so wowed by him. They were like, we got to give this guy a show. So after one guest spot, he gets his own series. We could see this was going to be the next great comedy star. We knew that this was someone who was not going to be a TV hit. This was going to be a, a, a hit of titanic proportions. The summer of 1978 was the beginning of Robin's rise to stardom. Production began on Mork and Mindy, and nothing could prepare him for the studio audience's overwhelming reaction. The excitement leading into this first episode, taping, was palpable. When Robin walked out on that stage, just walked out for the first time, the air changed. You could see it became crackly. Your hair began standing up. Something was going on. It's incredible how I mean, scientifically, of course, that makes no sense. And yet, it was true. You could feel it. The buzz on the set was nothing compared to the buzz about Robin. Only two weeks on the air, and they were in the top ten. The critics weren't thrilled with the show, but they were crazy about its star. Time Magazine said, Robin Williams sends Mork and Mindy into hyperspace. It basically became the Robin Williams show. I mean, you know, it was a hit because of Robin Williams. I don't, I don't remember who Mindy was. I mean, like, who remembers Mindy? Who was Mindy? Get down. <laughs> I am Mork from Mork. Nanu, nanu. <laughs> I'm, I'm Mindy McConnell. <laughs> Pretty All-American Mindy was played by another relatively unknown actor, Pam Dauber. The role was one of the luckiest jobs on TV, setting up Mork's jokes and laughing at everything he did. She was the straight man, although, you know, Pam, I think, doesn't get credited enough. She's very funny, she's very bright, and she's a good actress, and takes a good actress and a comic mind to be able to play off of his genius. You're not gonna have Mork without Mindy. I mean, you'll have something, it'll be good, but it's not gonna be that. Being a straight man isn't necessarily a gratifying role, but being in a hit show is. <laughs> the show was a pop culture phenomenon with a generation of kids wearing rainbow suspenders and greeting friends with the words, Nanu Nanu. If I had a dime for every time somebody came at me like this, oh, God. <laughs> it's almost 30 years. Everyone was running around going, Nanu, Nanu, Nanu. And you know, and it was always a thing of like, oh, I can do the Nanu, Nanu. And then the other kids were like, I can't do the Nanu. The rainbow suspenders, that was Robin's uniform. That's how he dressed. He always dressed sort of somewhere between a mime, mime and a clown. This is an example of how the TV series was smart enough to get out of his way and incorporate the way he really was. He shopped at a place called Aardvark's Odd Ark, a used clothing store, and he got everything from there. And he just liked suspenders and he liked buttons, which he had all over his suspenders. I definitely took some style cues from Mork from Mork because I, I actually had a pair of suspenders and I and I would start wearing them to school and I thought I was just like, I was thought I was the bomb. Everyone wanted to be like Robin. He couldn't leave the house without getting mobbed. His face was everywhere. From Time Magazine to kids' lunchboxes and talking Mork dolls, he was a TV superstar overnight. I watched Pam and Robin walk into this mall and this crowd that surrounded him. You know, it was like rock stars, you know, like the Beatles and that sort of manic attitude towards him. I cannot think of too many examples of people whose lives change overnight who are not thrown by it. He was thrown by it, I think. Robin was always on the move and indulging in the luxuries of superstardom. Between the drugs, alcohol, and women, he was living life in the very fast lane. I mean, come on, this was like late 70s, early 80s. If there was ever a time to be a Hollywood star, this was the time. Wherever he went, the velvet robes parted. He was always escorted to the VIP rooms. You know, so, I mean, he had, you know, everything that he 
could possibly want at that time. It was like, hey, we got money, it's fun, let's party. And Robin would be coming home at four and five in the morning and having to be at work at 10, which he wasn't. <laughs> I said, like, what'd you do last night? And he said, oh, I went to the comedy store. I said, oh, cool. And then I went to the comedy magic shop. Oh, really? Yeah, then I went to the improv. Oh, you did? He would go gone to like four different comedy clubs, which are in different places around town. And he'd be up till three, four in the morning. But in any case, I remember saying to another writer, boy, he has a lot of energy. And uh, he did. <laughs> but that energy burns out after a while. So it's kind of like on and off and off. Sometimes it was just asleep. During one of his late night stand-up sets, he got invited to hang out with fellow comedian John Belushi at the Chateau Marmont. Williams dropped by, shared some of Belushi's coke, and left. He's living the Hollywood fast life. He's going to all the clubs. Everyone's loving him. Robin, Robin, they want to hang out with him. You know, it all comes screeching to a halt. The Chateau Marmont sits just above 33, Sunset. when he died this morning. John Belushi was among the hotel's frequent visitors. John Belushi is dead. The bedroom where Belushi was found dead. The next day, it was Pam Dauber who broke the news of Belushi's death to Robin. I said, I've got some really bad news, but I, I put my arm around his shoulders and I said, John Belushi OD, they found him dead. And Robin, like, what? What? I was with him last night. I was with him last night. And... Uh, and he just, he couldn't believe it. And I remember clearly saying, if that ever happens to you, I will find you and kill you first. He said, I'll tell you, Dob, that's never going to happen to me. Someone said that I have that gland that normally censors people, that mine's burnt. <laughs> yes, it is, Robin. This mine's is very gone. true. It's Mine went away. Yeah. Somewhere about maybe, I don't know, maybe when I got dropped on my head as a baby. Miss Williams, I'm sorry. <laughs> Robin Williams' meteoric rise from struggling comic to star of Mork and Mindy came at a price. Years of alcohol and drug use had led to the death of his friend, John Belushi, and that fate haunted him. He was living that life, and it was, you know, it, 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 it nearly killed him. He's talked about it extensively, that he had significant problems. The impact of John Belushi's death was huge in Hollywood, and I think Robin Williams felt it really deeply because, you know, I mean, he was right there. I mean, you know, he's also a comedian. He's also living the same fast life. And I think, you know, he probably thought, you know, there before the grace of God go I. So, you know, he really straightened out his act after that. Robin kicked the drugs and alcohol in favor of a more healthy lifestyle. His wife of four years, Valerie Velarde, had been tolerant of his wild living, but she was pregnant now, and things clearly had to change. Within a year, Robin was clean, sober, and a father to son Zachary. It seemed he'd finally found happiness, but having a baby also brought Robin's own lonely childhood into sharp focus. He was a lonely kid, he was an only child, and he spent a lot of time upstairs playing with toy soldiers. And he ended up doing the voices and the effects. Robin was a sheltered, lonely rich kid who yearned for attention from his busy parents. Born in 1951, he was the product of a second marriage. It would be nice to say that he had this tortured childhood, you know, but he didn't, you know. He actually grew up in a fairly affluent family. Robin's early childhood was split between Chicago and Detroit. His well-meaning but stern father was a senior executive with the Ford Motor Company. Robin called his mother Lori a crazy southern belle. His mom was like Auntie Mame and was off having fun and shopping. Literally, Robin was raised by the help. Because I remember lambasting him once when he was passing gas on the couch, going, God, didn't anybody tell you that this is not what you're supposed to do? And I remember he went, he went no. <laughs> And I said, who raised you? And he pretty much let me realize he was raised by the help. He was short, and kids teased him for it. He was kind of picked on. Because Robin's very elfin, you know? And I know kids called him leprechaun. And it didn't help that the family was always on the move. Robin attended six different schools in only eight years. I think the key about his youth and understanding him is that he did spend a good portion of his childhood by himself. And, and being the new kid and moving around and, and being a bit of a loner. 
Robin may have been joking or just trying to distance himself from his childhood, but he started a rumor early in his career that he was from Scotland. Okay, now Robin Williams is a young man from Scotland. We're looking in three now. Three. three. Yes, Hello. young man from Scotland who went from Scotland to Detroit to San Francisco to Los Angeles. When we first started talking to the press, Robin was telling everyone he was born in Scotland. And I never to this day ever said, what the hell was that about? Robin's high school years were spent in the affluent San Francisco suburb of Tiburon, California. The counterculture was in full swing. Suddenly, the straight-laced Robin was loosening up and fitting in for the first time in his life. It seems that he sort of discovered when he moved west, when the family moved to Tiburon, and it was the 60s, and his mother said that, you know, somebody gave him a Hawaiian shirt, and all of a sudden there, there were girls, you know, and he sort of came out of his shell. I went from this very conservative all-boys private school to a kind of a gestalt high school. Yeah. And these guys are going, well, okay, well, you don't have to really study, like, just realize the potential of the books, you know. These were high times for Robin. He experimented with drugs and discovered almost by accident that he could make people laugh. That changed everything. After graduating from high school, he planned to study political science in college, but on a whim, he took an improvisational drama course, the acting bug bit. Robin went to an improv class, and I think it was kind of an, an awakening. Um, and started him down that road. In 1970, he switched schools to study acting full-time. He got his first taste of Shakespeare by day, and at night became a member of the committee, a cutting-edge San Francisco improv group. I couldn't find acting work in San Francisco, and I, I went to a workshop one night where they had these stand-up comedians, and I used to hang out the committee a lot and improvise with people there, and I remembered some of the things I improvised, and I tried them out that night, and they worked really well. In the first five minutes, it went great. So I thought, ha, huh, this is so much easier. And the, then the reinforcement was immediate. It was also your own work. You know, it's a combination of writing and acting at the same time, which worked wonderfully. When Juilliard held tryouts in San Francisco, he auditioned and was accepted on a full three-year scholarship. At 21, Williams was off to New York, where he would study alongside classmates like Christopher Reeve with professors like the legendary John Houseman. Can you tell within 5, 10, 15 minutes of seeing a young actor in an audition, that that person has it. Well, you certainly could with Robin, yes, because uh, I remember his first audition, I remember him at the school. He was a young man of extraordinary imagination and vitality and energy and talent. But Robin was frustrated at Juilliard. He just didn't fit in. After three years, he decided to go home to San Francisco, put a serious acting career on hold, and try his hand at stand-up. I think Robin was always funny. He just kept it on the back burner, where it kept bubbling and cooking, and then when it didn't matter what other people thought, he just busted loose. Yeah, like this. I mean, how'd I go from Juilliard to doing this? That's like going from the ABT to street fighting. In 1975, Robin Williams ditched his free ride at Juilliard to try his hand at stand-up in San Francisco, a breeding ground for promising young comedians. No one had ever seen anything quite like him. Robin, when I first saw him, as brilliant as he was, it was like a fire hose and nobody had a hold of the nozzle. You, know, you were aware that everybody in the audience was getting wet, but you didn't know who was going to get wet next. So cool is anarchy, and, and I felt like that was the way comedy's supposed to be, you know? It was like The Who or something. It was, it was more rock and roll. His brain seems to process it about... 3,000 RPMs faster than the rest of us. Uh, you know, he's got jokes lined up five, six down the road while the first one is coming out of his mouth. It's like the world is a Rorschach test and he's just like sort of free associating on, on, on everything. Robin's brain can take you anywhere you never thought of going. He's the Tiger Woods of comedy. These early sets were frenetic, bordering on the psychotic, what he called full tilt bozo mode. He played a collection of characters like Joey Stalin, the Soviet Union's lone comedian, and... Well, there's a character I do called Reverend Oral Satisfaction. Uh-huh. <laughs> and his Church of the Multiple Comings. Mm -hmm. Touch your TV. I want for those of you at home to touch the back of your TV and get a shock for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> a shock for Jesus? Now, don't do it. If there are any children watching, little children, don't mess with the television. Robin's outlandish sense of humor landed him a spot at the comedy store in L.A. His crazy act quickly got the attention of legendary producer George Slaughter. I was looking for 
performers for a new version of Laugh-In. And I went to the comedy store in uh, Westwood. Robin went on very late, and uh, he was strange. He had a beard, he was barefoot, he was wearing overalls and a straw hat. And he uh, put the microphone out over the audience and said, I'm fishing for ass Good evening. Tonight, I would like to talk to you about the serious subject of schizophrenia. No, he doesn't. Shut up. Let him talk. I told him that night, I said, if you ever want, if you ever want to shave that beard, get rid of that hat, put some shoes on, he had a job. And two days later, he came by the office, shaved, and said, I'm, I'm ready to go to work, boss. Good evening, and welcome to Laugh-In. Our names are... Michael Sklar. Toad. Robin Williams. Technically, Robin is perfect. Robin constructs a joke like uh, you would, an architect would construct a building. Marlene, who left? Screen door on? <laughs> That's some funny stuff, isn't it? <laughs> They're all just these little brief plays that he does. Every joke with Robin is a play. It's not a joke. It's a little mini movie or a mini play. I'm a graduate of the bad school of soul. <laughs> Who can believe only four short weeks ago, I was white? <laughs> That's right, I was white. The 1977 Laugh-In revival didn't last long, but it did give Williams the opportunity to work with some of Hollywood's biggest legends, including Frank Sinatra, Jimmy Stewart, and Betty Davis. What I enjoyed in those six shows was seeing the reaction of big stars to Robin Williams who they'd never seen or heard of. Uh, Mr. Sinatra, can I just shake your hand? Why not? Oh, Marlene, sell my clothes. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> I'm so happy to be here, I could drop a log. <laughs> and they were just stunned. I mean, wonderfully <laughs> stunned. Even celebrities, you know, they kind of get, you know, gobsmacked when they see him. His brief stint on Laugh-In got him an even briefer stint as a player on The Richard Pryor Show, which was ripped apart by the network censors. Then the part Robin was born to play came along, Mork from the Planet Orb. But with two failed shows under his belt, Robin was wary of the fickleness of network TV. He hoped this would be different. He became terribly afraid that the uh, machine of primetime television would grind him down to ordinariness. Mork and Mindy embraced Robin's distinctive style, and the show was a hit. His success on TV scored him the lead in his first movie, Popeye. The flick was an undisputed clinker. It looked like his film career was over before it even started. Robin did Popeye between the first and second seasons of Mork and Mindy, and the stories that came out of that experience were, again, legendary. A wild time on the island of Malta is what I heard. And now here's Popeye's star trying to give me the movie's message. I guess I, I, I don't know what the message is. Yes. I've lost the message. The message is in a bottle somewhere floating in the Mediterranean. One of the biggest flops in Hollywood history. And unfortunately, it was Robin Williams' first big starring role. At least Mork and Mindy was going well for a while. Four years in, it had lost its Midas touch. The producers tried everything to resuscitate the dying show, but the gimmicks didn't work. So they bring in the Denver cheerleaders and they bring in Ruck Hellwish. And, and so it got to be sexy and then Robin started doing a little more of his club act and Mork wasn't quite as naive. And, and, and it all changed. Mork and Mindy lasted four seasons, from 1978 to 1982. All the while, Robin continued to hone his stand-up act late into the night. But the audience craved more, not Robin. People yell out, do Mork, and he says, essentially, Mork's not here. You know, I'm a different person. And of course, he was much dirtier and much uh, more politically aware and things that were not part of the show, but you can't do that in prime time. If stand-up wasn't enough, and Robin was too raw for prime time, Maybe it was time to give movies another shot. After you've just changed a diaper, I'm going, oh, honey, can you help me? Just to see his little eyes go, I love you. <laughs> then Does he looks at the up? dog and goes, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> then you go, ha, 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 ha. At 32, with his TV career on Mork and Mindy behind him, Robin Williams was still searching for the right movie role. 
It took a little while. Um, you know, the first few movie efforts weren't uh, weren't all home runs. The world according to Garb and the survivors didn't hit. Then, a critical success. Mask on the Hudson is a fine acting job, and that's very early in his career. That's like his third film of any consequence. And he was already showing the kind of skills that got him three Oscar nominations. Directed by Paul Mazursky, the film tells the story of a Russian circus musician who defects in the middle of Bloomingdale's department store. He learned Russian and did the whole beginning of the movies in Russian, which I don't speak. And when we were shooting, I didn't know what they were talking about. They're all Russian actors and Robin speaking Russian. I was starting to get paranoid. I said, are you doing what, what the script says? You know, all of that. He's really good at Russian accents, Lord knows why, but he is. There's a great scene when he, he's defected and he runs back outside to say goodbye in a way to the rest of the Russians. And Robin was brilliant there, where he laughs and cries at the same time. Not easy to do. Mazursky brought out some, some things in him that I think other directors didn't. Uh, there's a wonderful stillness and melancholy. He kind of really quieted Robin down, and I, I actually think it's one of his best performances. For Robin and his family, the premiere in New York was a rare moment of joy. Robin and Valerie were dealing with an embarrassing lawsuit and allegations of infidelity. Robin may have been clean and sober, but he wasn't faithful. He met this cocktail waitress at a comedy club. They started sleeping together. And somewhere along the line, this woman, Michelle Tish Carter, alleged that Robin Williams had given her herpes. You. So she sued him for $6.2 million. And he countersued for extortion. I mean, he actually nicknamed the case Financial Attraction after Fatal Attraction, the stalker movie. So, you know, it, it was a really nasty sort of dispute. It went on for like six years. They finally settled it out of court. Robin Williams never admitted to anything. Robin's marriage was in shambles, and the split had taken a toll on his young son, Zach. Robin and Valerie agreed to hire a nanny to bring some stability to the situation. Marcia Garces became a calming influence in Zach's life and Robin's. Despite therapy, Robin and Valerie finally separated and by early 1986, he had hired Marcia as his personal assistant. When I was doing the cover story, she was uh, Robin's personal assistant at the time. It was very nice. He was going through a divorce and nobody knew that they were having a relationship and they did a expert acting job of uh, keeping it from me. When news of their romantic relationship finally broke, Marcia was skewered by the press as a marriage-wrecking nanny, an assertion that Robin vehemently denied. I kept saying about the nanny this, the nanny that, you know, we were not involved when she was a nanny, and we became involved after I already been separated for a long time. Typical Hollywood story. The nanny becomes the personal assistant, and then becomes the next wife. So, of course, everyone at the time was like, oh my god, this love triangle. But it did actually get a little blown out of proportion. I mean, it was a little more complicated than that. Hi, how are you? She got a very bad rap, and it, it hurt them very much. And it hurt her, of course, because she was being looked at as this, you know, wife-stealing nanny. And it wasn't like that. It really wasn't. They're just a great pair. And as frenetic as he can be is as mellow as she can be. Marsha's entrance into Robin's life marked the end of an era of self-destructive living and bad career choices. Despite the troubles in his personal life, Robin was touring the country to huge sold-out crowds. And he'd grab any mic he could find, even at the local burger joint. He'd be doing some funny accent going, we don't have those anymore. You know, <laughs> oh, just, we only have cat burger. You know, <laughs> like yeah, whatever it was, it was just so funny. You just, just say octopus? We have no octopus. You know. <laughs> During the tour, Robin did an HBO special, Live at the Met, taped at the Metropolitan Opera House in the shadow of his old school, Juilliard. When he played uh, at the Met, it was just, it was just awesome. It was this huge traditional building and this young man out there just ranting, and, but it all makes sense. As your mind is trying to grasp the first thing, the eighth and ninth and twelfth and fifteenth and hundredth thing that he said in one minute, 
comes flooding through. It must be the most exhausting comedic performance you'll ever see because he's not just standing on microphone telling jokes. He's running all over the stage. He's sweating profusely. Live at the Met was a devastatingly honest confessional about Robin's problems with alcoholism, drug use, and womanizing. And then the next thing you know, there you are at Betty Ford Hospital going, I'm fine now. <laughs> I'm a reformed alcoholic. <laughs> I feel so much better about myself. <laughs> ah, I am fine. No, you have that double vodka. I'll be over in the corner kicking the cat. <laughs> After the HBO special, Robin and Marsha headed to Thailand to shoot the first film that was pure Robin. One time he woke me up. Good morning, Raspinis. Yep. In 1987's Good Morning Vietnam, Robin plays motormouth radio DJ Adrian Cronauer. Good morning, Vietnam! Hey, this is not a test. This is rock and roll. Time to rock it from the Delta to the DMZ. Good morning, Vietnam is unimaginable without Robin Williams. I can't imagine Barry Levinson having even wanting to make that film without him. It's all Robin Williams. It's the, his whole persona is there. The, the crazy, manic, funny guy and, and the really serious, dramatic talent that, that can't be denied. Um, so, and that was, of course, the first film that got him a lot of buzz, and deservedly so. People realized, oh my god, this is like a really funny guy, but he really can act, too. The film was a smash, earning over $120 million, and got him his first Academy Award nomination for Best Actor. He lost to Michael Douglas for Wall Street, but Williams had finally proved he was much more than a washed-up sitcom star. It's official. You did not win the Academy Award. Oh, yeah, well, tell him, tell him to count again, but this time I'm going every other one. Oh, yeah, right, Michael, oh, Michael, Michael, Ma Now, let's look in here. Oh, Jimmy Hoffa. Robin Williams was now a critically acclaimed Oscar-nominated actor, eager to explore more serious roles. His first straight dramatic part was in 1989's Dead Poet Society, playing prep school English teacher John Keating. Well, that was Robin's first brilliant performance, really brilliant performance, where he as an actor showed himself, as well as then being able to, within the confines of that character, do his comedy. I thought that Peter Weir did a very good job of letting him do some of his improv in Dead Poet Society, but, but doing it within character so that it actually made sense. I love doing Dead Poet Society because working with Peter Weir is making a film, but it's also like working with a great teacher. That first scene where he's teaching a class and he's having the kids read the introduction about how to evaluate poetry, and then when he finishes it off, he tells the kids to, to rip out the pages uh, of the book. Rip it out! Thank you, Mr. Dalton. Gentlemen, tell you what, not just tear out that page, tear out the entire introduction. I want it gone. History, leave nothing of it. Rip it out! Rip! Be gone, J. Evans Pritchard, PhD. And these kids, you know, this very straight-laced private school just having a blast ripping out the pages. And it was just like, yeah, he's the teacher I want. And once again, Williams received another Academy Award nomination. It was two for two. He didn't win the Oscar, but he did win Marsha. They married and had their first child three months later, Zelda, named after the Nintendo game. It looked like everything was going great for Robin. And then a damaging article came out in GQ magazine, charging that not all of Robin's stand-up material was his own. There have been rumors that Robin Williams has blatantly stolen material from other stand-up comedians and paid them off. And so that sort of really kind of hurt his street cred. He sent many a check out to many a, a people. And I think, you know, for the most part, people were, were satisfied with that. But I know that there was Resentment. There was a lot of jealousy of Robin. People bitching that he would rip off their material because his mind, you know, worked so fast and was so, in a way, undisciplined. Although Williams has admitted to appropriating jokes, he says it's been decades since he's written out a check. In spite of the accusations, Robin kept busy as ever, including stints on stage raising money for the homeless with pals Whoopi Goldberg and Billy Crystal in comic relief. Billy and Robin together. I stand back. I'm the Vanna White. I just, you know, chime in, make sure you buy your shirts, make sure you use the number, and then they go on. And I just kind of watch them in awe. But Robin was still looking for the perfect scripted role. 
In the film Awakenings, he took the dramatic part of a doctor with a new drug to wake his catatonic patients. His co-star was Robert De Niro. I was afraid that Bobby would blow him off the screen because Bobby was Bobby. I said, don't worry, I will not allow that to happen. Number one, it's two people. And I don't think I did. I think that I kept him. I thought Bob was great in the movie. He had a very special relationship with Robert De Niro, more so than I think anybody else on the set, which followed the real life thing that Dr. Oliver Sacks did have a very special relationship with, with this one particular patient. Awakenings, that's who he really is. But don't tell anybody. Robin Williams is actually the better actor in the movie because he has this sort of shy, quiet, restrained, almost paralyzed emotional doctor who, you know, can't express himself. It's sort of a role reversal because you usually think of him having the flashy part and Robert De Niro playing the straight lace guy. You know, a lot of people felt, you know, that it was like a little bit schmaltzy. I think it was sort of like the beginning of that sort of, you know, career arc where Robin did a lot of these very serious, you know, sort of emotional, heart-wrenching films. But that one, you know, got a lot of good reviews. The reviews for his 1991 film, The Fisher King, earned him raves from the critics when he played Perry, a crazy homeless man on a mission to find the Holy Grail. His performance netted him yet another Academy Award nomination, his third in five years. It is a zany, um, hallucinatory, funny, heartbreaking, just breathtaking movie. If you haven't seen it, it's one of those movies that you've got to run out and rent. To me, it is the ultimate Robin Williams performance. I think Fisher King will be one of the films that will be in that first paragraph of his obits. I mean, it's that important to film in his career because it allowed him to be manic, but that was part of a character who was clearly disturbed. So it was a wonderful thing where they could exploit Robin Williams to the hilt and still, it's a serious performance. I think what everyone remembers from the Fisher King was his nude scene <laughs> when he goes to Central Park and you know, takes off all his clothes. And you concentrate on the clouds and you break them apart with your mind. It's you wild. Can't. No, but you have to be nude though, Jack. You can't Because you can't diffuse this. the psychic energy. This is New York. No one's allowed to be naked in the field in New York. It's too Midwestern. Well, come, come on, on, Jack. It's wild. It's, it's really freeing. What? I mean, the air on your body, your nipples are hard. A little guy dangling in the Viewers weren't shocked by his nudity, but by his hairiness. He's a hairy dude. Oh, he's the wolf. He's pretty furry. It never ceases to amaze you just how hairy he is. I mean, Robin's line is, opens his shirt and says, Oh, Darwin was wrong. Considering all his hair, it was amazing that he was cast as a woman in the 1993 hit comedy, Mrs. Doubtfire. Try on these panties, you know, you'll be funnier. The story idea came from Marsha Williams, Robin's wife, and former nanny. I don't recognize him when he's not dressed as a woman. We spent a lot of time in drag. God, I wish I was kidding. Uh, Robin Williams and Mrs. Doubtfire proved you look great in a dress. And it isn't just a matter of makeup, although it's good makeup, it has good costumes. It's a matter of him getting inside somebody in such a way that he ceases to be Robin Williams. You little dickens. That, that's yeah. terrible, isn't it? <laughs> no, okay. the, the catastrophe in the kitchen with, uh, with you know, his shirt catching on fire and him, you know, tamping out his bra with the, with the, you know, the tops of the pots. Yeah, and his breast caught on fire. Those weren't his real breasts, though. I want to have Mrs. Doubtfire as your nanny. Wow! Yeah, yeah, you know, maybe for the first couple of days it'd be a lot of fun, but then after that, you know, it might get a little scary. <laughs> sure! <laughs> you could tuck me in. Absolutely. What a lovely thing. I feel like a comedy pimp sometimes. No, what do you need, baby? You looking for funny people? You want funny people? You want props? What do you want? On May 27, 1995, one of Robin Williams' closest friends, Christopher Reed, was thrown from a horse and paralyzed. Robin dropped everything and rushed to his bedside. There's this story that, you know, when Christopher Reed was seriously injured in the horse riding accident, that Robin Williams appeared in costume, playing a, a kind of incompetent Russian doctor who was tending to him, uh, which gave Christopher Reed, I guess, the first good laugh he had had since his horse riding accident. When that horrible thing happened to Chris, um, 
And Robin was just there. Robin has been so wonderful. Robin does such good things people don't really even know about. Robin and Marsha became solid supporters of Reeve and his family, helping to raise money for research on spinal cord injuries. He was so there to support Dana in Chris's tragedy, and then he and Marsha were there to support Dana through her tragedy. And, and uh, Robin's a, a fierce and loyal friend. With the loss of Christopher Reeve and later his wife Dana to lung cancer, Robin has pledged to be there for their young son, Will. He took care of an awful lot of stuff there because he's a very generous person and a loyal friend. He does a lot of things that people don't know he does. Because the truth of the matter is, he's in incredibly shy. He's a very quiet cat, you know, and people don't think that of him. But the truth is, he, he is a very solitary fellow. This ruins a myth for people, I think, that, that Robin is perpetually on. Here's the deal, when he stops moving, uh, he actually ends up uh, being a sweeter guy than he is even talented. Robin's sweet side was reflected in the characters he played. Bells of St. Mary's. But critics found some way over the top. After a string of schmaltzy roles in Hook, Toys, Jumanji, and Jack, Williams joked that he was working something out from his childhood. It's kind of weird in a way because, I mean, like, Robin Williams, in a way, is the ultimate man-child himself. But, you know, it was a little sort of strange to see him. kind of played the same person and role after role after role. I think people got a little tired of that. People want to ask you, why did you do the movie? For the money! <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you! He's trying to save the world with his heart and his smile. You know, the, the Patch Adams kinds of movies. There was a terrible run of those, about five in a row, where, you know, people in Hollywood were just sort of calling for the head of Robin Williams. They just wanted him to stop. And, you know, stop saving our souls already and just get back to being funny or get back to being dramatic or something. That happened in 1997, when Robin read the script for Good Will Hunting. You really see the intelligence, you know, that, of that character, and he really created somebody that you believed in, and you sort of forgot that it was Robin Williams. And you wouldn't know about sleeping, sitting up in a hospital room for two months, holding her hand, because the doctors could see in your eyes that the terms visiting hours don't apply to you. You don't know about real loss because it only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. I doubt you've ever dared to love anybody that much. But when you finally get to Goodwill Hunting, you're seeing the kind of Academy performance that they love. He's really emotional um, and really restrained and really quiet. And it's so far removed from the Robin Williams that you know that you just can't help but be moved by it. This, at last, was his Oscar-winning role. His performance proved the fourth time was the charm. It takes him almost two decades to finally win the Oscar. Then suddenly, after that, it was like he dropped off the face of the planet. After Goodwill Hunting, Robin turned to a variety of interesting roles in smaller independent films. The braver and more interesting things will always be in the independent work, but the studio films keep your, your lifeline going to that audience of yours. Remember, I'm Robin Williams, I can still be funny, but I can still be very serious, like in One Hour Photo, I can be a little creepy. He was doing a lot of roles that people didn't expect to see him in, like in One Hour Photo, in uh, Insomnia, he's playing these really dark roles, um, you know, playing killers and stalkers and really unsavory characters. They never really caught on with the public. Most critics yearned for him to return to his comic roots, and he finally did with RV a film about a very dysfunctional family on vacation together in a rented mobile home. Robin is very comfortable with the romance of the unknown. <laughs> when you're working with Robin, all you can do is pay attention to everything he says and does so you can keep up with him. Otherwise, you're still on page four going, oh, I didn't, I didn't know he was gonna say that. Can we? Cut. <laughs> okay, close. Real close. Back to comedy on screen. Just as crazy as ever off. Oh, ow, ow, it's okay, buddy. What are we wearing today? Lederhosen with bike pants and uh, a cloud jacket. It's a jacket that looks like clouds. You want one? No, no. Hey, I'm cool. Cool. These days, Robin Williams is out there doing it all. You want to know the truth? I do. I'm a bike sexual. <laughs> I like to ride hard, I like to ride long. We'll talk. He likes to ride bikes. 
And he's like, uh, oh, you know, I'll get you a bike. And I'm like, no, nah, it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> you know, it's just, oh, no, come on, what, it'll be fun, though. Uh, no, I don't think so, brother. And late at night, he's back where he started, on stage. He goes out to the comedy clubs, waits until the last performer has performed. It's like, you know, 1.30 in the morning. And he gets out on stage and he improvises for 30 or 45 minutes. And that's his idea of fun, relaxing. When we would do shows together, people go, wow, Robin Williams, that was wonderful. And then they'd be like, yeah, and then Bobcat went on and he said those things. <laughs> He's definitely proven himself to be more than just, you know, the crazy Mork and Mindy comedic actor. This is a guy who's had just an incredibly diverse career. People remember the movies like Good Will Hunting and like Dead Poets Society, you know, like Good Morning Vietnam, where he's getting nominated for Oscars. And he's just a guy who is so talented that he could do anything. Robin is a product of our time. He's a product of the confusion, of diminishing attention span, of a, a national attention deficit disorder and a product of a whole lot of hard work. Robin's no accident.